<clears throat> okay, so uh, today is, um, um, uh, you know, I, I, I learned um, yesterday actually that uh, today there are 2000, um, uh, let me see if I had it correctly, 71 years since Julius Caesar, Caesar uh, the great uh, Roman uh, emperor, um, when he crossed the Rubicon, uh, the river, he uttered alea iacta est, which means the dice is uh, cast or the dice was cast, is translated in both ways. And because I always had an interest in uh, architecture and chains or aleatory architecture, and thus, you know, architecture and dice, I thought, let me prepare quickly um, a material about architecture and randomness. So here we are talking about architecture and randomness, 2,071 years after the day when Julius Caesar uttered, I, I use the verb that I found on Wikipedia, uttered alea iacta est. So let's see. Let's see what this subject uh, uh, brings to our, atten uh, our attention. But first, I was intrigued by this um, quotation from this important uh, North American painter, an artist, Frank Stella, who actually talks about architecture. Architecture can't fully represent the chaos and turmoil that are part of the human personality but you need to put some of that turmoil into the architecture or it isn't real. And I would agree with Frank Stella. Unfortunately, many architects avoid to address that turmoil, which I'm sure at least sometimes belongs to them as well. Any human being, any human life is trouble sometimes. And there, are, there is sometimes even chaos. We have to acknowledge them. But, but I think it's, as, a, as architects, it's also important to, 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 to say something about this chaos and this turmoil that uh, manifest themselves in, 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 in our lives, and maybe not as rarely as we would like. Plus, chaos is uh, it's maybe, I don't know, some people think it's a good thing in disguise. Um, you know, I, I met once a, a mathematician from California, Abraham is, was his name, I don't know if he's still alive, who invented the word, he invert, invented the word this chaos. So we have order and we have disorder. And then we have chaos, which is supposed to be opposite or opposed to order, but there is no transformation as, as uh, of this word, the way there is a transformation of the word order into disorder. So he thought of inventing the word this chaos. What would this chaos mean? Because it's, it's order, but a different kind of order. And I'm thinking somehow perhaps this is similar to what the Romanian poet Lucian Blaga wanted to say when he said, um, Disorder is another kind of order. And in reference to the Romanian village, uh, you know, the traditional village, which was and is very different from the Saxon village in Transylvania, where he, he was born, there are both, both villages, Saxon and Romanian. The Saxon villages are more um, organized, uh, more strict, uh, in a way more severe to an extent, but the Romanian villages uh, are more, um, uh, in a way, vulnerable, uh, fragile, uh, disorganized, disordered, but there is, a, there is a more subtle form of order in that apparent disorder. So maybe, maybe Lucian Blaga was correct. Also, I read that in science, in the present, there is, uh, well, for some time there was talk about spontaneous order. What is spontaneous order? Apparently nature is governed by, by some kind of order, which is not of the rational kind that we humans conceive. 
So if we can uh, somehow bring to architecture that so-called spontaneous order, we become ourselves more spontaneous and more, uh, uh, in a way, more, you know, enjoying life. Because I think life is, uh, can be quite a, quite a pain uh, when, uh, when lived in, um, you know, uh, uninspired ways, you know, in almost in contradiction with, your, with our true nature. Playfulness is absent. But how can you create without playfulness? Uh, Frank Stella doesn't talk about playfulness here. He talks about chaos and turmoil. But somehow, you know, perhaps we can we can say that uh, playfulness saves us from from the turmoil and from the chaos. And uh, you know, uh, throwing the dice uh, could perhaps have some um, uh, you know beneficial effects uh, both on 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 our own lives and on our activities. And if it is a creative activity, all for the better. But coming back to Frank Stella and ending uh, about him with this, I do think it's important that architects do not neglect what appears to be uncomfortable. Chaos is needed, actually, sometimes for, um, uh, you know, even God starting from chaos, no? Uh, we are less than God, of course, but chaos is very often uh, um, that turmoil, fruitful turmoil from which many artists uh, nourish themselves. Let's hope the architects uh, do not avoid that chaos too often. So here there is that uh, here there are uh, you know the little uh, you know uh, rounded the corners cubes, and uh, this I I just began I, I didn't know how to start this presentation so I just I just threw in kind of like instead of dice a few images. This is a fragment of a um, uh, housing complex in France by Jean Renaudie. I'm going to show other images and it is a remarkable truly a remarkable housing complex. And I'm happy it was built. Unfortunately, uh, he died young uh, too, but he left something behind. We'll, we'll see more images of Jean Renaudie. Uh, this is a, a project I did myself for um, the Guggenheim Museum in Helsinki uh, for a competition, but I didn't, um, I didn't send uh, my, my thought to Helsinki. But you can see randomness here, all right. I mean, uh, you know, I was I was literally uh, uh, um, uh, emptying myself of will of my own will, and I allowed uh, things to happen. And when I arrived at something that uh, didn't displease me terribly, uh, I, I stopped. But I will say more about this because I will show uh, a few more images. Uh, you know, look at this urban planning. Can we call it? it's an unplanned so-called planning? Yeah, you know, I, I, I have great admiration for this, something like this. And this is in total opposition to what we do these days. You know, I'm absolutely sure something like this is not even discussed <clears throat> in the faculty of urbanism. Because this is not an ism. You know, it's, it's, it's organic. It's, uh, it's, uh, I, I, I wish we could build in this way. But uh, in order to build in this way, we have to have that uh, um, wisdom and modesty of those people without training in architecture, because this was not built by people with training in architecture. But no one could contest the, the, the organicity, the, you know, the, the, yes, the charm of this uh, uh, fragment of a town. And there are many, many like this. I mean, most medieval towns and villages and cities do have this quality, a quality which we lost. We lost in the name of its majesty reason. And reason in so many cases brings us on the verge of uh, paralysis. And uh, we have to reflect seriously on this. This is a house built by uh, uh, Kazuyo Sejima, by Sana. I'm going to show a few more images about it. Uh, of course, the, these, these uh, fragmentations 
you know, there is an aleatory, uh, you know, uh, aspect to it that cannot be, um, you know, uh, unseen. It's it's clear, but but I, I had some reservations, and now may, maybe even more um, because I think uh, uh, throwing the dice or um, um, you know uh, allowing change to manifest itself is not just about form. Uh, it's about many things, maybe even color. You know, maybe even the angles that we use. You know, yes, there is a level of um, of um, you know indeterminacy here but there is also a certain willfulness that i see maybe the willfulness is uh, is dictated by the limits of the plot of land it's possible anyway in praise of the donkey why do i mention the donkey maybe you know i i i i, I mentioned this before le corbusier was a great adversary of the donkey he said that the donkey is stupid because the donkey avoids the big stones, while um, a man, meaning a human being, knows exactly where to arrive at the goal and goes in a straight line straight to the goal. So in opposition to, to the zigzagging of the donkey, uh, Le Corbusier thought that a human being with uh, uh, his uh, undisturbed uh, uh, will uh, knows how to arrive at the goal, at the target. But, but strangely, paradoxically, uh, Le Corbusier in his later years actually wanted to build a monument to the donkey in India. So maybe he changed his mind. I personally think in the present, we need badly zigzagging. We need badly the donkey, the donkey that avoids the big stones. Now, to accuse of the donkey of having no will is a little bit out of place because it's known that the donkey, if the donkey doesn't want to move, nothing can move the donkey. I mean, it could be a, almost a monument of, of tenacity. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, all in all, I think we need nature. Today, we need badly nature. Trees, grass, donkeys, birds, you name them the more the better. And uh, the donkey as a symbol of that spontaneous order that nature mysteriously uh, masters uh, should not be forgotten, I think. Uh, another image that I brought in, but I, I, I'll show many things uh, in a more organized way uh, very soon. Zigzagging architecture, I already mentioned this verb, which I like to zigzag. Uh, with the zigzagging of, uh, of, uh, of the donkey, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's about many things, actually, this uh, zigzagging. This is a building, of course, by Toyo Ito. I'm, I plan to show it more in detail, the Mediatek in Japan, um, which has the, 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 the columns are approximating something of, of, of that uh, um, chains, um, mentality or activity of nature, although it sounds strange to talk about the mentality of nature. No, it's not quite uh, the best language, but you understand that the, the, the principles of nature do not avoid what we call, uh, you know, a uh, chance. Um, this is a building you can find, in fact, many people know it because it's an important building by Toyo Ito. Toyo Ito also had the problem is I show some of these works uh, quite often and I didn't want to repeat myself. So I didn't include uh, images about this work and other works which could have been present in this presentation uh, in a very legitimate way. But because I don't like too much, I, I repeat certain things. I, I didn't include them. I know I regret a little bit, but I still have uh, 200 pictures it would have uh, it would have arrived at 400 very easily now chains made visual art by john cage john cage was a very interesting uh, musician composer uh, who advocated the uh, chains music or the music of chains and he made uh, if you see his uh, musical notations 
their beautiful artworks uh, and the quite unusual you wouldn't expect you know musical compositions and notations to look like this let's see some of his uh, uh, visual art uh, chains made uh, visual art by john cage a very very interesting uh, man um, you know his uh, his art uh, is uh, indeed uh, is um, is um, animated by uh, by the the emptying of one's will meaning his own will can we make architecture in this way i think we can i truly believe there is great potential actually in an art in a in a will less uh, way of, of, of uh, imagining and i don't know about building but initiating the project with as little will as possible and with as much um, naturalness or uh, now the word naturalness again is is not is not very well chosen i'm afraid today uh, i want to improvise in a very inspired way because I, I i don't feel i'm very inspired maybe the gods of change want to want to sabotage me a little bit i don't know but i'll try my best i will try to be intense and then not to not to not to utter too many stupidities um, i i love john cage and uh, I, I i suggest to you to search for his name on youtube you can listen to his music you can see his art he was a very very interesting um, uh, an avant-garde um, uh, musician uh, an artist and thinker and um, influenced of course by the orient by zen um, uh, you know i am asking myself <clears throat> why <clears throat> architects don't do such drawings <clears throat> these days because we don't i i i, I you know the, this kind of drawing uh, in its purity and its lyricism but it also in its esotericism is is something that architects don't do i think we are too divorced from the metaphysical we don't think and we don't feel in philosophical terms in poetical terms i understand on one hand is understandable because the architect works with measures with uh, matter with materials uh, but but uh, the musician also works with uh, you know of course here this this was a special musician <clears throat> because he advocated chains music or the music of chains or aleatoric music but we could have an architecture uh, of this sort and actually there are we, we there are already many buildings that are built in this way and even many projects done in this way uh, even archigram had to a certain extent an aleatoric uh, uh, architecture but let's look again at the graphic works by uh, by john cage um, you see he welcomed disorder he welcomed you know if you want to call it chaos and uh, many artists did so but architects are uncomfortable with 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 this because they cannot control it and the architect uh, needs to control and maybe if we begin to control less it would be uh, something positive happening you know i i wonder again why can't we conceptualize architecture in these terms for example at the beginning in this way, uh, possible way there are many other ways but let's imagine with this way with with words let's say you have a site plan on which you have to build something to imagine a building and you just uh, you know uh, write just like john cage did on the on the site plan some thoughts some feelings expressed through words kind of in a similar way you know and then transform those short fragments of text into possible buildings you know it's or uh, you know there are there are architects who use painting to start a project with they start painting will also did it uh, massimiliano fuxas did it uh, uh, here is a musician john cage john john cage was not an architect but 
it, try to imagine as an architect that you begin a project with exactly this image, this drawing, this watercolor or whatever it is. How would you make your building or buildings starting from something like this? I personally think it might be a very liberating uh, project because if I if I if I imagine starting an architecture project from what I look at now, uh, I, I I I feel tempted to to become very imaginative, and uh, I think we need we need more imagination, uh, or like this, could an architect start? you know, or work in this way, relating to a, a certain project, why not? In an atmospheric way, why not? But unfortunately, we are so trapped in the rationalist uh, paradigm that, you know, to, to, to uh, visualize our uh, aspirations towards a building in this way is inconceivable, but um, it should be conceivable. If this works for a musician, why wouldn't it why wouldn't it work for an architect who at least is a visual artist uh sorry here i misspelled this every day is a good day it was a serious i think there is even a book with his artworks uh i'm talking about john cage uh, i think they are beautiful i i like these graphic works they are very sensitive and uh, and uh, you know, uh, you could imagine many things looking even at this um, uh, almost non-existent um, uh, drawing. I, he also has a book or a series called Hyper, Hypermnesic. Apparently, I didn't know what this word means, uh, so I searched on the web and the, apparently it means someone who can recall in very vivid, very precise uh, uh, way a past. Interesting. So I'm thinking, what about a hypermnesic architecture? What would that be? So these are a few works from that series by uh, by John Cage, where you can see again that the, the willfulness, uh, certainly the willfulness of the rationalist is absent. We are talking about something else. But uh, uh, art is, uh, in a way, uh, um, bringing us closer to what we reject, and that is um, uh, that is nature. Uh, again, I remember what uh, Winnie Mas said, and I'm disappointed to to mention again that I do not agree with what he said about um, outsmarting nature. Now. No architect should ever say something like this, and no artist, and no musician, and no writer, and no human being, actually. We cannot outsmart nature. Musical notations. Now look at this. It's splendid. It is splendid. I have no other word. You know, it, 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 it's a musical, I mean, this, he performed music based on something like this. Isn't it beautiful graphically? How do you explain it? This is about just as the, the architect makes a plan for a building, a musician, a composer uh, writes uh, these musical notations for performing a piece of music. But graphically, this is impeccable. It's a beautiful uh, artwork. That is just a means towards achieving a certain music. Very, very nice. So again, if music can connect with the graphic art in this way, in this unexpected way, why couldn't architecture? Why couldn't an, a student in architecture make an architecture project kind of like this? You know, what would the professor say? They would, say, they would be speechless because they, because in order to in order to make something like this you have the you have to have the open mind of a john cage and or to understand something like this but it's all in essence it's about spirit but but since with this spiritualized architecture completely of course we cannot imagine an architecture project at least in its incipient phase in this way or in this way isn't it beautiful? I think it is. How would you build, let's say, a fragment of a city uh, looking, uh, starting from this musical uh, 
uh, notations of, uh, of, of uh, John Cage. Now, okay, what is here perhaps could become a building because uh, we have seen buildings kind of like this, but what do we do with, with the rest of the things? And yet architecture and music are sisters. You know, it was even said, I am uh, only repeating something uh, too well known, although very little uh, uh, is practiced. Architecture is a frozen music. Is it? Maybe it should be. Today I discovered when I prepared this, um, you know, experimental presentation, this gentleman, another composer with beautiful musical quotations, Robert Mora. Look at this. You know, it's 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 the musical sheet for a for an opera. Uh, it, 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 music becomes graphic. Equally, I would say graphic work could become musical, and equally, I would say architecture and architectural projects could become musical. Uh, what if we ask? What if we make the plan of a building or the plan of a you know, a town or a village or a fragment of a town or a village or a city in such a way that a, a, a conductor looking at those plans could perform their musicality, could perform their music. Let's, let's imagine that we can make plans for a house or a street or a housing complex and so on in such a way that a musician could could perform a music just looking at the plans, at the drawings, at the sections, whatever is shown there. Can we do that? But uh, so again, this is done not by a graphic artist. This is done by a composer. This as well. It's magnificent. I think it's magnificent. Um, I keep saying to myself and to others, architecture needs badly metaphysics. It needs to escape the, 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 the banality of its approach to what architecture is. Of course, in the end, I mean, it has to come back to matter, to materials, to dimensions. It does, it does need them, but it shouldn't start with them. Look at this too. Imagine a building built from this or from this or from both, two buildings face to face. Although these are notations, musical notations for a musical piece, you see, four visions. Very, very nice. They are cryptical for someone like me who doesn't have the necessary musical knowledge and not, doesn't know about the arcane aspects of avant-garde music but I admire them with my eye. Uh, angels of silence. Are we, are, is the architect thinking about such, you know, distant matters, angels of silence? And what do I see there? Maria Russo, viola. <laughs> Obviously I'm becoming patriotic, a Romanian musician there on the, on the, on the poster. Maria Russo, viola. When, an, when will an architect collaborate with Maria Russo or with a musician or with a composer or so on for a project together? Wouldn't it be beautiful? I think it would be. Uh, why don't we do it? Chaos theory, fractals and architecture. Of course, they seem to do uh, chaos and fractals. Somehow they, they, they seem to be uh, neighbors in a way, any kind of fragmentation perhaps. And yes, uh, architecture in some attempts lately um, could connect with chaos and fractals. Now, I show a very interesting house built where else? In Japan, uh, the Daita 2019 house by Suzuko Yamada Architects. I love this house. So this innovative Tokyo home was designed to mimic a forest. Japanese architect Suzuko Yamada recalled the trip to Africa and the improvised architecture of nature for the inspiration in her striking three-story design. Here it is. The, rational, the rationalist would become speechless. The rationalist would have, uh, uh, you know, probably uh, some, some kind of uh, troubles with the heart, maybe 
uh, you know, uh, the pulse would, uh, would accelerate or uh, the other way, because the rationalist cannot conceive something like this. The rationalist to think that this is nonsense, that this is uh, unacceptable. But, but what to look at here is a, a, a happy family living quite well in this, uh, in this house in Japan. And uh, they commissioned the architect to do this. The architect is a lady, bravo to her. I mean, she has all my uh, admiration for this building. You know, it's a building which also almost becomes a non-building. It's a building which, which wants to become a forest, yes. It wants to become like, like this here or like this here. Compare it with, of course, it, it has another side to it in the back. But what I see in the front is in opposition. It wants to become nature. Let's put it this way. And it is about process. It is about becoming. It is not about being. It is about becoming. And it is about embracing change. Change, yes. The, the vitality of life depends actually on chains. How beautiful are actually chains encounters when or when the rain starts? OK, you might not have the umbrella on you, like in Paris, where the, the rain starts out of the blue sky. It's OK. Life itself is a sum of such unexpected occurrences, you know. Uh, but unfortunately, the architect is so afraid of the unexpected that wouldn't accept easily the house that the Japanese built. And you know, as it is outside, it's almost uh, the same inside. It's a, you say it's a house in the process of becoming, you know, uh, but I love it like this, you know, because it's like a beginning. It's the promise of a house. The tar in Turkey, there is this saying, when the house is ready, meaning is finalized, here comes death. This, this house does not welcome or invite death because, because it's not yet finalized, it's not yet done, or so it appears to be. And I like this, this fact. OK, I, I like uh, processes. I like uh, becoming. It's true. But there is, there is a life here that uh, cannot be denied. And the, the, you know, the, the front elevation is, uh, is magnificent. In fact, it, I'm not even sure it can be called elevation any longer. And look, the interior is also, I think, beautiful. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a knot in a way, a web, um, you know, of relationships. But uh, I see the books, I see shelves, I see, I'm absolutely sure the owners of this house are uh, special themselves. Uh, they are rather well to do, you know, they, they commissioned an architect to build this house for them. You see the car, but they also wash uh, clothes. You'll see in some pictures uh, hanging clothes, you know, although they probably, or maybe they don't have a washing machine. If this is so, all for the better excellent house and uh, <laughs> you know how do you plan this i i guess at a, at a certain point at least you do have to plan something but uh, you know at the beginning at least uh, you are rather in a fog uh, it's 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 about welcoming the disorder of life the beautiful disorder of life something which can be encountered in many traditional towns and villages and cities. But now since, uh, you know, the so-called enlightened uh, modernity, everything had to be, you know, rational and prescribed with severity often. But fortunately, there is a reaction to that. And here we have it. Uh, an example, of course, there are others, but I, I, I love this house. But again, if you make such a project in the architecture school, you would be dismissed and you shouldn't be dismissed. No, you shouldn't be dismissed, quite the opposite. You should be applauded. A 
And this is this is a house which which says you know I, I don't have rigid convictions you know and I love its fragility well towards this street because in the back is a little bit different I guess any life including that of a building has some dualities maybe unavoidably but um, I wonder what this child uh, growing up in such a house feels. Um, I, I, I am tempted to imagine that uh, we'll grow like a healthy human being without the dogmatic, uh, rigid, uh, paralyzing and paralyzed convictions. Now you see there is a part which is not so different from you know this one. In fact, it's almost identical. But we can forgive this part of the house if we contemplate or focus on this one. Um, yes, it's chance. It's uh, you know, it's uh, it's unplanned almost, or maybe without almost. It's possible. I like it very much, and you are going to see a little bit later. A new facade for San Lorenzo competition I launched many years ago, and an Italian architect, who at that time was living in, in Great Britain, sent a project kind of in this spirit to cover the, the elevation, the unfinal and non finalized uh, facade of San Lorenzo by Brunelleschi with uh, something like this that you see here. And I thought it was a brilliant idea. Uh, the child is learning the piano here. Nice. Uh, th this child, in my opinion, almost unavoidably will become, uh, uh, you know, uh, an adversary of, of dogma. And the tree, you see the lady, the owner of the house, uh, you know, hanging a shirt here for, uh, you know, This moves me because it's about life with simple things, yes. Well, that's not what mainstream architecture advertises. You know, you have to have a washing machine. Everything has to be, be clean, no disorder, no, nothing without being controlled. Well, life is not like this. Look at this um, the curtain, you know, it's... Uh... <laughs> It's, it's as it is because of a certain action upon it and uh, to bring, to open the window or whatever. It's okay. A great house, truly great. Much better than Villa Savoie. Sorry, Monsieur Le Corbusier. I couldn't live in Villa Savoie. I just couldn't. There is no surprise that no one lives there. Uh, but here I could live, yes. And you don't even need shoes if you live in this house, as you can see. If someone is looking at the laptop, I am looking at someone looking at the laptop. I am looking at the, uh, the screen of a laptop, at someone looking at the screen of the laptop uh, inside the picture. Anyway, you see here the sign of life, you know, this is eternal, you know, we are in the sophisticated uh, 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 Japan, but uh, this can be seen anywhere in the world, except in some stiff, uh, you know, urban um, quarters where no one would do something like this. But, but although obviously these people are not, uh, you see the car and, uh, you know, they build this house, uh, they could afford it, of course, uh, um, a washing machine. But this structure in front of the house, kind of invites for the improvisational uh, little acts like this, you know? And I think even the clothes are happy where they are. Yes, they breathe some, you know, more or less fresh air, okay, in as much as possible in a modern city. Um, nice. Nice, because it is saying yes to the vitality of life, unrestrained. Okay, now these are the drawings published on Arch Daily, a little bit too sterile for my taste after we saw those beautiful musical sheets, uh, musical notations by those two composers. 
uh, what can we do? Fortunately, the house, the built house is much better than what we look at here, but uh, you know, that's what it is. Uh, these were made for presentation, I guess. I don't like them, I hate them. <laughs> because then there is no life in them. Again, if we compare these plans for otherwise a very nice house, very alive house, with the musical notations of those two composers we saw, we see the difference between a, a non-musical architect and uh, very visual uh, musical people. Now, a new facade for San Lorenzo, I mentioned this. Uh, this was done about 20 years ago. And Gianluca Pelisi uh, from Italy proposed, unfortunately, the, the, the project, uh, I don't have it in a sufficiently good um, uh, resolution, but I, I amplified a little bit two images, like you see the section. So imagine this is the building of uh, Brunelleschi, the famous San Lorenzo, the facade for which even Michelangelo made a proposal but was not built. And the Italian architect proposed in front of it something very similar to what we saw in the house in Japan. Of course, just a project. And you see the rain, the rain falling on this uh, scaffolding because essentially it's a scaffolding uh, celebrating again uh, life, the disorder of life, rain, the sunlight, you name it, the wind. And this is another image of the, the same project. Um, he over obviously welcomed chaos or disorder or, uh, you know, manifestations of what, uh, you know, more or less scientifically it is called the spontaneous order of nature. Now, Tadashi Kawamata, again and again and again and again and again, Japan, the Japanese. Now we are going to see a Japanese artist, what he does also in the name of aleatory uh, actions in, uh, in, in art, uh, connected somehow with architecture. Look at this. You know, it's, it's um, he uses all kinds of recycled materials. Now, maybe, I mean, I don't think everything is pure, but I like what I, I look at, you know, because here we see, again, what one can do with imagination you know, in an unplanned way. I mean, okay, you could have a strategy, right? To bring these things together. But that's all there is, a strategy. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, please uh, remember this name is important, an important artist, Tadashi Kawamata. Uh, he has also a partner, Catherine, I forgot her, her last name. Um, he does this sort of thing where he works with the, you know, found objects, found materials, and creates, transforms them through different configurations into, into art. Uh, here he is uh, working with a lot of wood. And uh, by the way of it, we are going to see uh, something to an extent a little bit, uh, a little bit similar done in, in, in Romania in, a, in, a, in an attic by two students. And one of them is here. I hope he's still here. Um, Kabamata. This is, it is art. But, you know, just like in the, in the case of the house we just saw in Japan, uh, you wonder, you know, maybe this is uh, something in the process of becoming, it's not, it's, it's something that cannot remain in this way. Well, it is an artwork, that's, that's what he does. And he, 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 he arrived even at Mac in Vienna, in the museum, he did something similar, not so dramatic, but uh, here he did, unfortunately, I didn't find another picture you know, sabotaging the certitude, the formal certitudes of the facade of a church in this way. And it's, it's good, it's refreshing because it's, 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 uh, it's again, it's about the beginning. It's, it's about uh, the promise of, of something that you cannot uh, configure or figure out from the beginning. It's, 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 it's um, yeah, it's an invitation to, to start anew, to uh, look what he did in Toronto, I think, in Canada, between these two stiff neoclassical buildings, 
he brought in this maddening, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how to call it, you know, rurality, arte povera, you know, uh, whatever it is. This thing is is uh, adding something. It's not subtracting. Well, it is subtracting from the stiffness of the neoclassical buildings and is uh, is polemical towards them. And I think we need such polemics. Kavamata, the Toronto project from 1989. Chains, aleatory, you know, this is uh, in the terminus. How do you make the precise uh, plan for this? You can't. Now we arrive at Jean Renaud, the French architect who unfortunately also died rather young, but he left something remarkable. And is this housing, housing complex? which I admire very much and which, again, is not talked about in our urbanism uh, schools and classes. Why? Because it's dangerous. You know, this you cannot control through reason, you know, through regulations, through dogmas. This man was a visionary in the 60s, early 70s. He built something like this, you know, uh, and no one talks about him, when in fact we should talk about him. It's, it's incredible what, what, what education chooses to ignore. In the name of what? In the name of sterility. That's, that's the reason why, because we are afraid of something like this. But he built it in France. I so regret when I was in France, I searched for it, I couldn't find it, but um, maybe uh, if the pandemic goes away, I'll, I'll have a chance to go back. I want to see Jean Renaudy because he was excellent. You know, it's now some people talk about houses, you know, uh, becoming mountains, right? Uh, even Ingels and others, but uh, Renaudy did this uh, 50 years ago. Uh, and uh, I think in, uh, in more convincing ways, actually. Now, in the terminate arrangement, uh, here is, uh, I was rather ironical because how, how could you arrange, you know, uh, in an indeterminate way? When you arrange, you already manifest your will. If you manifest your will, indetermination uh, vanishes. Uh, these are some images uh, of uh, tables that I arranged together with some students in the School of Architecture here in a moment of madness, but um, uh, refreshing madness, maybe all madness is refreshing to an extent at least. Uh, we played with these tables that exist in the, in a, in the studios and we turned them upside down we, 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 we uh, found pleasure in uh, creating chaos. And uh, I have to say, the students, after we did this, they found an alcove for themselves, each one in a different place, and began to draw and to, it was very stimulating. Because yes, this uh, apparently totally irrational uh, so-called arrangement was actually a vital invitation towards a beginning, towards starting the adventure of a project or whatever. We enjoy doing it. Of course, after a few hours, we, we put the tables in the back uh, uh, position, which was actually a, you know, a sad thing to do. Uh, I regret, but we did it then. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I, I still think we need uh, we need experiments and we need you know the vitality of turning things upside down when necessary sometimes at least chaos chains it's not really chaos I actually I think none of the students that uh, uh, you know worked on this if I am to use the word uh, the word worked they played they were playful felt that, that this was uh, chaotic. No, they loved it. Uh, uh, yes, you could say again, the functionalist would say, 
you cannot draw on this, not with a T-square and a rectangle. Well, I'm not so sure. You could maybe standing up or whatever, you know? I wonder what kind of a project would you do, you know, on, on this, on, on, on such uh, disturbed uh, tables. Anyway, uh, we move forward. Uh, here they are, two of the students with myself here, you know, working to disturb even further the, uh, you know, the, the furniture in this uh, studio. Now, Su Fujimoto, the final wood house, you know it. I, I talked about it, you saw it, uh, you didn't need me to, to, to discover it, to see it. But I'll show a few images of it because Fujimoto is indeed relevant to this theme. Um, uh, architecture and randomness. Hey, look at this interior, you know, it's random. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's a space which is uh, uncomfortable, which could be uh, comfortable if you make some, uh, you know, additional uh, gestures there, or uh, I don't know, but all in all, it's true, it's a cube. So towards the outside, there is determinacy, but inside there is indeterminacy. And uh, this indeterminacy allows people to uh, employ the space in, in uh, unprescribed and unplanned ways. And I think this is a virtue of what they built here or he built here. There is a variety of activities that take place which are not prescribed as usually they are prescribed in a so-called functional plan. Here you don't have such a thing. There are no prescriptions besides the fact that, yes, was the outside is a cube. But once you enter the cube, you envision your own uh, choices within it. And uh, I, I, I like this building, you know, it's, uh, yes, it's an unconventional, so-called unconventional uh, building. But uh, I think we need such uh, at least once to be built. Yeah, that's how it looks towards the outside. And you see even the openings have a level of capriciousness. They, uh, uh, these erosions of the walls towards the outside are, uh, you know, randomly uh, placed, but it's okay. Now, graphic works of Henri Michaud. Why do I mention Henri Michaud? Because when I made a presentation on uh, uh, Luigi Moretti, uh, I discovered that he had a collection of graphic works by Henri Michaud. And I remember that uh, Henri Michaud was friends with Emile Choran. And uh, uh, Emile Choran even had, I think, at least one or two drawings by Henri Michaud, his friend, his Belgian artist. And his drawings, his graphic works are very relevant to this theme. Uh, here they are. You know, this is the summum of randomness, you know. But I wouldn't say they are, you know, you would say there is no center, there is no order. I'm not so sure. It's an implicit order, not an explicit one. Any good artwork, just like the uh, the musical notations of John Cage and the other composer uh, being a good graphic work does have some implicit, sometimes supple, subtle order within it, although it's not uh, apparent. I would say it's the same with the drawings of, of Henri Michaud. An interesting uh, artist, poet, and so on, Henri Michaud. And then you will see a, a door gate, a gate uh, designed for a building of Moretti, uh, an artist, not himself uh, designed it, but uh, kind of in this spirit. So this is the relationship in this case between the artist uh, and the poet Henri Michaud and uh, the um, designer at least who made uh, that uh, uh, gate uh, for, um, Italian architect. Anyway, but uh, the Italian architect had this, this were part of his art collection. And uh, yes, his architecture is not like this, but I think he liked, maybe he would have loved to do such an architecture, but he couldn't. 
anyway. Uh, so uh, Luigi Moretti commissioned or asked uh, Claire Falkenstein, Falkenstein to design the big iron fence that encloses, uh, it's called the cave. It's a villa, Villa Saracena that Luigi Moretti uh, built and it was published on, on Domus in 1970. But what interested me here is the, the, the iron fence. And here it is. It's, it's, it's like a, it's like a drawing by Michaud, uh, Henri Michaud, you know, and you know, you would say it's uh, in Romania, it's a beautiful world uh, that I truly like, Muzgalial, it's a scribbling, you know, but it's done with, uh, with iron. I think it's very nice. And indeed it's about uh, taking chains or uh, allowing chains to manifest itself. As I put it, let's give chains a chance. It's a very nice uh, fence, gate or whatever it is, but uh, I think it's very nice. And I'm happy that it was built. Now Sana, the Nishinoyama house, uh, about which I have some reservations in general, but uh, I still included it. I didn't have too much time to reflect on uh, to do it or not to do it. I, I like the fact that there is some, some kind of uh, aleatory uh, movement here, uh, but, uh, and I think she did a good thing. Now, is this a single house? Apparently it is uh, quite big compared to the other houses. It's described as being a house, not houses. Uh, so by fragmenting an uh, otherwise, uh, you know, oversized uh, monolithical thing, uh, she or they connected with, uh, with the houses around. But um, I actually thought before I, I studied uh, this uh, project, I thought it was several houses, not just one. For just one house, I think it's just too big. Uh, it's, uh, I, I still hope it's, it's more than just one house. Although I didn't see the, the plural in its descriptions. Uh, all in all, there is here uh, a, cert a certain movement and you see the plan. Yes, it's done with the strict lines, made in many rooms. It's hard for me to believe that this is just one house. Now it's probably used by many, by many, a number of people. Uh, but even here we see some kind of a rhizomic, uh, you know, uh, intermingling, or I don't know how to call it. It's it's uh, a certain fragmentation which borders on on disorder, even if the lines are strictly, um, you know, rectangular. Sana Kazuyo Sejima. I still think it's a good work. Uh, uh, it's a good work uh, built in Kyoto, Japan again. Now repairing ad hoc the roof structure. This was done by two students who were attempting and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, succeeded to repair a roof structure without planning. Maybe, uh, I mean, from what I know, um, from one of the students I was talking to, and I think he's here, Bogdan, uh, uh, you know, they, there was a certain strategy in their minds, but they almost in an ad hoc way, they started to repair an old roof that was deteriorating. And so this is the old roof. I, I'm just, why did I include this? Because it is really about the, well, the pain, but also the joy of ad hoc interventions, you know? They're not construction workers. They are, yes, architecture students. But they, they took upon themselves to build this work uh, in this uh, spontaneous way. And they did it with wood that, uh, that um, you know, was, uh, was from, I don't know how it is called in, in English, palets. Um, anyway, I guess there are only Romanians here, so uh, you understand. You know, to, 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 to make that wood from palets, available to, to, to repair a roof is, uh, I would say, adventurous enough. And you'll see that in the end, the structure looks rather convincing and interesting. And if you plant it, if you plant it in a rational, cerebral, so-called normal way, here they are, they are, 
working on the you know uh, on on uh, you know dismantling uh, the i mean we see some <laughs> this is not a model of what they they achieved but it almost looks like a model of it of course it's disorder it's you know they just put some pieces of wood here but uh, uh, all in all uh, I, I mean you know okay maybe i'm a little bit nostalgic a little bit patriotic a little bit i don't know what i'm friends with the with, with bogdan and but uh, um, what i'm trying to say is uh, building is actually not such a you know we make it uh, you know terrible through excessive uh, premeditations excessive you know signatures uh, you know stamps uh, uh, approvals of all kinds I think of the builders of uh, you know old times or in villages still in africa or some other parts of the world they build quite well without uh, all that uh, nonsense that makes our life uh, totally unbearable. And here they are, you see, <laughs> repairing the structure of the roof with in an improvised way. And I would say uh, ingeniously, joyously, and it probably works. I hope it, I hope it does. But I, I mean, I imagine the work was hard. And yet I think there was also joy. And probably more joy than you know, working for um, some you know uh, project in the school where you know look uh, the opening I mean the the hole in the in the roof uh, was uh, significant uh, but but they repaired it and they repaired it welcoming uh, you know the joy of the joy of improvisation and it's fine jazzistic architecture sure. Why not? And look at it. Yeah, I think it's much more interesting than if you would have made it, uh, you know, like uh, everything else in the roof. Okay, it's different, but but what's wrong with being different? I think it's fine. It's a wounded uh, building. It's a wounded roof, but the wound received some affection and some work, and uh, through the randomness of the whole thing. Uh, arrived at a certain uh, functional outcome, and that's good. Um, so you know these pieces of wood were not uh, you know cut to order, you know measure to no. They they were found as I said in those pieces which were made for something else, not repair roofs with with them. But uh, look, uh, you know. Uh, this is truly a sustainable uh, activity. We have to we have to consider it as such, you know, to make the most with the least. And yes, in a spontaneous way, uh, maybe partially, you know, I am sure the the professional builder would say this is uh, no, no, no. But why not? It's much more interesting and creative than what a so-called professional uh, builder would have done. Look at this. It's almost an artwork by itself. Now, the Votruba church in Vienna, done by a sculptor who built a, 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 a building, and one of the most remarkable buildings in Vienna was built by a sculptor. And look at this. Uh, you know, is there indeterminacy and randomness here? Of course it is. You know, uh, yeah, yeah, an architect with formal training would not have easily done something like this. No, <laughs> no. But uh, you know, someone who didn't study architecture was free enough to to do it. So Gotruba did it. Is there randomness here? Yes, it is. Would Caesar? Would Caesar have loved it? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. He was still an emperor, so I don't know. But being a great emperor, maybe he had a, the imagination that would have appreciated something like this. It's possible. Um, you know, Napoleon, who was kind of the equivalent of Caesar, 
was uh, himself a complex man. I, I read, uh, he was rather skeptical about religion. He, he said that uh, religion is what keeps uh, the poor from not murdering the rich. <laughs> In a way, it is, it is probably true. I mean, I shouldn't laugh, but somehow the word murdering is, um, you know. <laughs> I mean, try to imagine that without religion, the poor would, would murder the rich. Of course, the churchmen would protest, would say that, eh, sorry, uh, Monsieur Napoleon, this is not, uh, this is not why uh, we have religion. That's not faith. But uh, it's possible that uh, Napoleon was, uh, was not so far from truth. Now, I don't know if I, okay, I'll, no, no, I don't feel like showing. I, I, I have a few things that I did. I should have shown something else now, but the problem is I, I did, uh, I did, um, well, it's true. I, 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 I found pleasure in doing unintentional architectures, which are about uh, chains architectures. Yes, unintentional. How do you make a, a, a possible building unintentionally because most of the time you know uh, it's the first thing that animates a project the intention what is the intention how how do you but what if you make uh, buildings without an intention like Lebia Sud said uh, we should first build our buildings and then learn how to live in them you know uh, how would you build a building without thinking of its functions without uh, intentions. Can you build a building without intentions? Well, when many years ago, a young uh, uh, architect who was trained in Cluj uh, told me about Archicad and uh, he gave me a, you know, uh, I installed on my uh, laptop or my computer uh, Archicad. So I began to play and I played and uh, I, I, I found joy in, in playing without intentions. Yes, it's not yet so-called serious architecture. It's true, it's not. But in its superficiality, uh, there is the promise of something, of something interesting, a possible interesting outcome. Okay, I'll show you quickly because I showed this before and I don't want to, to repeat myself. A possible skyscraper here. I did, uh, well, this was something else. I bought this, uh, it was a game with uh, pieces of wood. Uh, I bought it from a flea market and I was playing with them and here it is, a possible skyscraper. Is it possible? I think so. Yes, each piece is uh, in fact uh, something not very different, was built uh, recently in Amsterdam, the village by uh, MVRDV. Well, part of it, but it's the same, the same strategy or mentality at work, you know, it's here they are all the same. Imagine that you have here one apartment, which which is uh, you know prefabricated, built in the fair, and you bring them in and you play with them, as I played on the table with these things. And I think it could be a very interesting skyscraper or tower. That's not maybe the word skyscraper is too tall, so to speak. But uh, you know, again, playing without an intention. I didn't. I was just playing, absent-minded. Can we do architecture in an absent-minded way? I think it can. And you know what? At the postgraduate um, course in Vienna, excessive, run by uh, Hernan Diaz Alonso, the students who were already architects, young architects, uh, uh, Hernan Diaz Alonso, who was the director of this program, told them, don't make any sketch. In other words, don't have any intentions. Just plunge into the project without any kind of premeditation, without any kind of uh, you know, intention. And it worked. They did brilliant works. You know, I did this thing with any, without any kind of intention. Of course, if you want to make it into a feasible um, project, and it is possible, you have, to, you have to do something else more than this. But at the beginning, you can work without intentions. You can start a project without any analysis. I know the schools of architecture are obsessed by analysis, 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 analysis. No one talks about synthesis. They only talk about analysis. 
Well, what if you do a project without any analysis? You just, in an absent-minded way, like a child who loses himself in playing, as Jean Nouvel claimed that he always worked in this way, and if he was sincere, it's appreciable because it's true. If you can work like a child who absent-mindedly, you know, plays with the seriousness of a child who absent-mindedly plays, you can do great things, I'm sure, without analysis, with all, without all that unnecessary, stiff, and ridiculous in the end, uh, premeditation and cerebralization and intellectualization and graphs and all that nonsense that actually nobody looks at. Much of the work that is done for that is uh, useless, really useless and joyless by definition. Now a possible structure, this was a, this was a bag with potatoes that I bought. Unfortunately, I had pictures also in color. It was red, but these are the black and white pictures. I thought it could be a very nice structure, but it was a bag in which I brought some, some potatoes uh, home. You know, <laughs> I wouldn't mind at all if I would be able to build such a, such a building with such a steel structure, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, the pictures are not great. I, I really did this in a hurry. I should have put the, the colored ones in red, but I still like the, the idea. You know, you buy a bag of, uh, of, of potatoes and, and as an architect, you admire the structure, the weaving of the bag. And uh, here could be a possible interesting, inciting, enticing, uh, you know, uh, structure, uh, quite fluid, no? Yes. <laughs> anyway. Now, this is a project I showed before uh, very quickly, but I showed an image of it and I'll show it again. Initially, I did this with Articad, and now I regret I didn't, I didn't uh, persevere in this. This was the site. This I did again, absent minded, meaning uh, uh, in a random way. Uh, with Archicad, a very old version. I can only work with that old version. But this could have been a very interesting building just like this, playingly playing, if I am to express myself in unacceptable ways. But then, you know, I did something else. This was the site in Helsinki for a competition for the Guggenheim Museum. This was the site. And uh, thought, uh, the, in the same way, uh, without premeditation, uh, welcoming uh, randomness, being absent-minded and being very playful, I did this. This is the top view of the building. And I called it, if the icebergs are melting, let's build an iceberg. So uh, here it is. You know, that's all I did because that's all I, I, I know how to do myself with my own hands in Archicad. Not everything is perfect here, but uh, I wish I knew more. But all in all, it's kind of something that I could have uh, been perhaps not too ashamed if I developed. Anyway, but done again without premeditation, we're just in, in a random way, and you can see in the plan. You cannot plan this, it's impossible. In a way, this is also kind of a forest, like uh, that forest that that lady wanted to make her house that she built well for other people uh, look like. And then a possible architectures, so-called architectures randomly conceived, but they could be pre-architectures. I still, I could myself, uh, maybe not digitally, but manually, but again, what I show here is the same uh, strategy. Without intentions, absent-minded, meaning uh, emptying yourself of your own will to play, to play until you arrive at some kind of a so-called product, a configuration that satisfies you. And well, maybe not only aesthetically, for a certain uh, purpose, um, you know, exp they are formal explorations, but form is important. And uh, because, you know, imagine you build this without knowing how to use it later. 
but that you can discover later. You just build what you see, exactly what you see. And then if you need to uh, inhabit the, the, the thing, you begin, you create a door, you create a window, you make an opening, you maybe you enclose, uh, you bring in an additional enclosure or something. And I think it's possible to, to build in this way. You know, here you have just a, uh, you know, a beginning without, uh, uh, you know, a strong uh, intentional uh, uh, mechanism to, to govern uh, your gesture. And I did all kinds of, uh, these are not very dramatic and especially after parametry and all the rest, this could uh, seem uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, inadequate for our time maybe, but here, you know, I, I could imagine an apartment building or housing, uh, you know, social or the, I don't know what, with apartments in these uh, boards. And then with this uh, unexpected, because if I would have used my reason, I would not have made such codes, impossible. They, they came into being, I didn't search for them, I found them. That's why I said found architectures. As Picasso said, I do not search, I find. So these things found me. In fact, I could even say I didn't find them. They found me. I'm playing, you know, I was playing. But it's very liberating. And, you know, if someone may be a little more, uh, you know, uh, no, I wouldn't say because I try to be serious too. But someone with, the, uh, with some qualities that I do not have would take this and develop it into a, yes, a housing complex, I'm thinking. It's possible. I would love to live here, you know, to have a vertical apartment that I enter from the top after I take an elevator here and go to a corridor and then descend into my own quarter here. Maybe, I'm not cynical. Uh, again, chains, chains uh, pre-architectures. Uh, this was a, an exasperated attempt to, well, here I had an intention to design the houses of, of love around uh, Valentine day, uh, some seven years ago, I, I made about 40 of them. They are not yet houses, I'm very aware of this, but I could make a house out of this. I could, and if I use my conventional wisdom, trained in a, formally in a school, I would not have arrived at something like this. It can be li very liberated to allow chains to inform you and you become just the, you know, manipulated in a way by chains. Anyway, this was, I think is the last image of the, of the, the series. And I end with again, a possible well born from frustration, house of love. That's all. <laughs>